All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the meetup. So this month it'll be the Calgary Python meetup plus the Element Python meetup plus the PyData. So it's a uh, Alberta Python event. I am super excited about it. So first of all, I would like to thank our long-term collaboration partner, Timit. So Timit is a recruiting agency that recruiting teams for the company. Uh, if you're looking for jobs, definitely reach, reach out to them. And secondly, I would like to thank Startup Management for uh, supporting the uh, Remo for us. So uh, this platform that we're using is called Remo. And uh, apparently, I like it a lot. So thanks a lot for that. And I would also like to thank Viewpoint for uh, collaboration. So uh, Ben, do you want to give some word for that? Uh, sure. I mean, so Viewpoint, it, Viewpoint Investment Partners sponsors by data, um, providing you know money, resources, um, compute, re compute hosting for some of our, our stuff and so just wanted to thank them for sponsoring PyData. Awesome. All right, so I have some jobs listings here uh, and these links are all clickable, so uh, feel free to check them out. So there are some intermediate and senior uh, developers opportunity at Talos and engineer manager and SE2 at Digital Oceans. And there are lots of positions at TechoLogic, so uh, from front end to back end to DevOps to project managers. And there is also a software engineer position at Viewpoint. So today's talk would be one talk by uh, Peter Tankis. Uh, uh, it's revisiting sequence, sequence to sequence application beyond machine translation. And the upcoming event. So uh, the DjangoCon Europe is uh, June 2nd to uh, 6th. It's online and there are more events here in this link. Uh, PyData is also a proud member of the YYC data community. And there are some upcoming events in this link here. So uh, definitely check it out. Some news here. So uh, Python 3.10 beta is released and 3.9.5 is now available. Django also has the uh, bug fix and uh, security release for 3.2.7, uh, 3, 3.1 and 2.2. Uh, and yes, I forgot to share the slides. I just quickly shared the current slide number in the, in the chat. All right, uh, reading for the month. So the first article is uh, switch case statements are coming to Python. As you all know or may not know, uh, the switch case was decided not to be supported in 2006. And now the community decided to support it in, 2000, uh, in 2021, Python 3.10. And you know, there was a reason that it, why it was not supported. And apparently the reason becomes stronger that it gets supported. So uh, feel free to check out this article. And there's links to uh, PAP634 and 3103 in the link. So uh, if you're interested, feel free to check out the historical reasons. The second article is uh, the art of writing loops in Python. So apparently, instead of just writing the for while loop in Python, you can use the building functions like the enumerate and product iter tools and yield to make better loops. The third one is top 10 data science products for beginners. Well, it's uh, not bad as a starting point. It, it has projects from EDA to um, uh, feature engineering to like modeling. So uh, definitely check it out. It's uh, pretty fun. The last one is turn your Python script into a real program with Docker. So this is really good introduction for Dockerizing your Python script. And in fact, it's a really good starting point to uh, use Docker with your Python and you can actually extend it to your Python program or you know, web app or whatever. All right, as usual, here are the links for the COVID stats. And our next meetup is June 23rd. We're all always looking for uh, presenters. And if you feel like you would like to give a presentation, definitely reach out to us. 
So uh, our information is here, and there is a Slack channel for both the um, uh, Calgary Slack channel and so definitely check them out. Uh, feel free to reach out to either uh, me or uh, Andrew or Daniel or Ben in the Slack channels. So um, yeah, that's it for me. I will pass it on to Peter. All right. Thanks so much. So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the talk. My name is Pete Tunkus, and uh, I am a data scientist with R-Curve Inc. here in Calgary. And today, let me see if I can get my thing to work here. Um, if it's going to work at all. All right. Does, can you all see this? Carson or just want to make sure that it works before I take it away. Yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, works. Okay, perfect. Awesome. All right. So yeah, the topic of uh, the topic of my talk today is going to be all about the sequence to sequence model um, and try to get us to think a little bit about how this particular technique could be used beyond just uh, you know, machine based translation of languages or things like simple chatbots, right? Um, as far as, you know, I, I, I'm not the I'm not like the expert of all experts, right? So um, it's you know I don't know that everyone that that uh, anyone really is. But with that said, right, um, the sequence to sequence model had only come across my radar fairly recently, and and you know any time that I'd heard about it in the past before recently was with respect to you know translating from English to German or to French or whatever. So or simple chatbots again. So it's it seemed like a good opportunity, you know, alongside this experiment that we had uh, started here to, you know, maybe talk about this a little bit more and get us to think about how, you know, sometimes old older models, well, older models can still have their uses in in a variety of cases despite, you know, whatever new technologies, models, techniques and that sort of thing transformers and betters have come out in the last couple of years. So without further ado, I'll I'll get started here. Um, quick agenda is, uh, you know, first I'll, I'll kind of go over, you know, what what brought this topic up um, at all, right? And why, of course, uh, sequence to sequence seemed like a logical uh, way to go as far as uh, our little experiment was concerned. Um, and after I talk about that, then I'll I'll give kind of a high level primer on uh, what sequence on what the sequence to sequence model is, how it works again at a fairly general level, right? I'm going to try and stay away from too much technical jargony stuff, but you know, um, there's there's plenty of material out there on the internet uh, to get really into the weeds on that, and then kind of finish with a couple of caveats um, to keep in mind uh, whenever you want to try to use this particular technique, as well as uh, a little bit of brainstorming that I've started off in terms of potential use cases for the sec to sec model. Um, but of course, you know, I'll, uh, along with anything that I say today, you know, I, I absolutely encourage folks, if you're curious, to go out and, and take a look at some of the tutorials or Kaggles, you know, uh, type articles, blogs, that kind of thing out there that exists for this and, you know, get the, get, get the old brain juices flowing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So a little bit of background, right? So like why this topic and, and where did, you know, trying out sec to sec even come from? So some of you, or, or perhaps many of you attended YYC DataCon this year, right? And if you did, perhaps you had a chance to see the presentation where Mike Morley and I in our toques presented a hobby horse project in which we are bringing together various pieces of geological and geographic data in a 3D spatial data model using Neo4j, Python, and, and a number of other different uh, bits and pieces, um, which of course begets potential opportunities for a variety of extensions and experiments that can be applied um, in this case, you know, for the substantive topic across energy resources, mining projects, um, and, and those project lifespans. And so personally, as someone who has, you know, an applied background in social science and banking, you know, financial services, insurance, right, this presented an interesting challenge, because I think it's fair to say that, you know, when I started this, I knew very little about energy and mining industries in terms of their nuances, and that sort of thing. And probably fair to say that I still know very little, but maybe I know a little bit more than I did before, and just enough to follow along. But yeah, so one idea that had been floating around, 
uh, though, was something that I felt could that I could play with as far as applied approaches are concerned. Right. So before the data are even brought into the graph, they have to be collected. Right. Not just in terms of the work in the field, but in general terms of digitization. Right. So for example, the work of collecting and cataloging cataloging geolog the geological drill or borehole samples is a time consuming task. Right. So that means we have to get, you know, both junior and senior geologists involved. They're field engineers, that sort of thing. And, you know, this is the kind of work that goes into oftentimes um, mineral or geological exploration. But, you know, as I've learned, sometimes, you know, the drilling happens even past that point. Right. So it can it can be just to check on, you know, things like, you know, what's in the ground now that we've actually drilled something or, you know, help us make decisions about, you know, sustainability or even re remediation. Um, and, you know, all of all of this whole data logging process, right, it's accomplished manually, whether it's the collection. So, you know, writing notes while looking through a microscope to cataloging, right, in terms of scanning the notes and holding on to the PDFs or dumping them in, in, in a data lake somewhere or whatever it is system that we have in front of us, right? And so this proximally accomplishes the goal of collecting and aggregating data. Um, but you know, old data often have a funny way of coming back and surprising us with all kinds of new uses that you know we wish we would have known about once upon a time, right? And it's hard to work with something that's still you know pen and paper when we need the data now. So you know, this doesn't really touch in too much about like the the efficacy of digitizing your data, but you know, eventually at some point, it's you know, if, if it's not important now, it's going to be important later. So might as well get it, you know, nip that in the bud when we can. Um, in any case, though, right, so this kind of spurned this idea of moving towards a proof of concept, right, because people in the field will find this to be a familiar issue in terms of how long it takes to enter these data and like what goes into this whole process. And, you know, while we're not advocating for replacing um, or, you know, exchanging, you know, the kind of field expertise that's required for this kind of task with, you know, AI, um, you know, we can at least help out, you know, if you're filling out a digital form to log borehole drill samples, you know, like what if there was something like um, something, you know, that could pre-populate stratigraphic layers with hints or suggestions, right? Um, and in effect, right, this, you know, I was having a conversation with a, a buddy of mine who works up in Fort Mac. And, you know, he said that if you have a good understanding of the regional geology, you could most likely predict the next stratigraphic layer, right? And that, and if that's not a prompt for something that could be, potentially automated or at least, you know, auto automatically assisted, right? Um, you know, what is, right? So the idea is, is this, right? Would it be possible to provide that assist when it comes to documenting those layers at a site or in a region, right? Again, not realistic to replace the kind of expertise required to collect the data in the first place, but it might be possible to at least provide kind of guided hints or something like an autofill, sort of like when you type something into a Google search bar so that whoever is actually going back and filling in, you know, the data set, um, you know, the task is at least uh, alleviated somewhat, right? You know, again, it's worth a try, seeing if, and just in terms of, you know, seeing if it works. It's the beauty of experiments, they're low cost, low pressure, see what happens. If it works, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And so one thing I learned early on was that these borehole samples are kind of like sentences. There is an implied pattern or an order to each layer, i.e. a sequence, right? And so naturally, the first thing I did was look up sequence prediction on lithology sentences, stratigraphic layers, borehole samples, that sort of thing. I didn't really find anything that quite hit the nail on the head as far as uh, my point of view was concerned, right? There weren't any real slam dunks. And indeed, stepping away from the geology or the mining context, uh, ener energy context, that sort of thing, we know that boosted tree models can be used uh, or applied to classify sequences, sort of like a many-to-one type problem. Um, but again, this didn't really seem satisfactory, especially not for an experiment, right? So, you know, I if it's an experiment, I might as well try something new and different and, and uh, zany or whatever, right? Um, but again, it didn't quite fit the bill. So, you know... I then thought about, you know, in conversations with, uh, with you know, the, the bigger, the YYC Datacon project, so I'm talking with Mike Morley, you know, why not treat the lithology sentences as just that, right? Sentences, right? He had, he, you know, Mike had kind of prompted the idea by thinking like, oh, well, maybe we could apply NLP uh, or an NLP technique to this particular situation since, I mean, technically the lithography uh, layers themselves are tokens, right? 
I mean, we could replace we could replace those tokens with whatever um, label we want, whether it's numerical or character or whatever. But nonetheless, there's an implied order, right? Shale, belt, and bedrock are usually at the end. Topsoil usually at the beginning. Till, sand, clay, whatever is in between. In sometimes consistent patterns, typically across geographic areas. Um, and so, if we're looking for an autofiller. Indeed, what if we applied an order-sensitive sequence predictor like the ones used for translators or simple chatbots, right? Thinking about things in terms of question to answer or language one to language two. Um, and so this is where the sec to sec model finally comes in, right? So again, you know, I'd heard about this method's use, as I'd mentioned before, right, for language to language translation and chat bots, but never really had considered it outside of those contexts. And honestly, I never really needed to, right? Nothing really prompted the thought in my mind. And fundamentally, right, this is a model that consists of two recurrent neural networks to encode a set of human readable inputs as machine readable vectors, right? Predict a set of output vectors, decode them accordingly into a set of human readable outputs, right? So it's a multi-layered neural network model. Um, and, you know, this frees us from having to strictly adhere to sequence length and order of, an, of a given input, while still constraining prediction by acknowledging that some items in the sequence only appear in some conditioned order. Again, we shouldn't expect topsoil to appear after bedrock. Um, silly example, but nonetheless kind of keeping to the theme of, you know, let's see if it works. Um, and so indeed, you know, the benefit of multi-layered approaches featuring two uh, RNNs is this essentially, right? If we know about the first two or three items in a given sequence, we can't guarantee that there will be exactly three or more items remaining in that sequence, right? Like there might only be five layers in a given drill sample. And if we already know the first, if we've already entered the first three, then the last two, right, is not last three, right? And then unlike a single RNN layer, right, where every input corresponds to an output. sec to sec takes into consideration not only the order of the input sequence, but the meaning of that input sequence into a single vector, which, you know, we'll refer to, which we refer to as a context vector, and outputs a corresponding predicted set of items in an appropriate sequence based on, you know, that interpreted meaning of the input sequence, right? And I'm sure, right, that there are other multi-layered neural network models or whatever else that might be worth trying. And, you know, there might be even better ones that have come out more recently. But again, in the in the spirit of applied ex exploration and experimentation, right, the sequence and effective temporality of those stratigraphic layers is important, right? And thus, the choice for sequence to sequence and how it's built kind of makes sense, right? And so, indeed, surely we can just use sec to sec for something other than just language to language translation or chatbots, right? Um, and so thinking about that, um, you know, today I, I wanna, instead of going necessarily through the results of the experiment that we covered at YYC Datacon, um, do wanna say it's it's a work in progress and appreciate the feedback. Gave a, a couple of screenshots from that original uh, presentation that we uh, whisked, whisked uh, those of you who were there uh, through. Um, but right, the initial the initial results were were less than stellar. Right, it ended up being a perfect till predictor. Every layer was till forever, um, and you know clearly you know there were issues with uh, with uh, the training and evaluation that sort of thing. Um, I can get into a little bit of why that was the case later. It'll kind of be part of the caveats, and you know as we kind of go through the mechanics, um, it'll make more it'll make more sense why things turned out as poorly as they might have in the first place. Um, and there are some improvements that have been made recently, but um, just given new data and stuff like that. But nonetheless, um, it is a work in progress. So big hedging on my part, I guess. Um, but in this case, right, I would like to spend some, talk, some time talking about the approach as sort of a primer for those of you who haven't heard of sec to sec before, or, or a refresher for those of you who have and might not have thought about alternative uses other than translators or chatbots. Um, and indeed, you know, Again, part of this is just because as I've learned about sec to sec more intimately, I found it pretty interesting in terms of how it works, at least conceptually and you know, based on um, what I learned, not just about the model, but also about the platform. Because um, indeed, as I had mentioned, right, I'd never really need to use sec to sec and other than some articles or blogs from a number of years ago, I never really saw the model come up much. Um, and so, you know, um, I figure at the same time as, you know, so maybe there's a reason for that, but sometimes just because a model or technique is old doesn't mean it's useless. So uh, other other bits and pieces for what it's worth, I'm 
all the work that I did and, and what I'm learning and, you know, the way that I learned about this was through using PyTorch. Um, now for, for the record, I'm rather agnostic regarding any debates on the merits of PyTorch versus TensorFlow. Um, I, the former seemed like it had more custom customizability at first blush based on like tutorials and stuff that I found. And, and it did come suggested by a couple of friends when I was talking about my ideas. Um, again, I'm sure they're both great or terrible for their own reasons, but fundamentally, I don't think that that should impact the point of, uh, our line of thinking today, right? So again, I encourage anyone curious to check out the various tutorials you can find out out there um, that use either platform and honestly come to your own conclusions, right? That's part of the fun of, of the work that we do is the research and exploration, not just uh, the 90% of our time spent munging data and that sort of thing. Um, but again, yeah, the first crack wasn't super, super successful, but technically it worked. So um, plotting onwards, right? So let's go to a quick primer then, uh, just to cover an overview of, uh, of what sec to sec is. And uh, broadly speaking, right, it's also referred to as an encoder-decoder network. You'll probably find it more frequently labeled as such in some of the early academic and uh, archive papers out there. Um, and in principle, again, you know, kind of mentioned this earlier, but um, it does use uh, a set of recurrent neural networks to encode a sequence of inputs into a single vector, a context vector. Um, which essentially contains the abstract representation of that sequence. That vector is then passed to a decoder recurrent neural network that predicts the corresponding output sequence and decodes those embeddings one sequential item at a time. Um, and so if you kind of look at the picture that I have here, uh, for those of you who have already, you know, been there, done that, right, this is near identical to what many of you have probably already seen around the interwebs. Um, I just modified a cleaner version uh, just to fit the context here better, right? Most of these kinds of images feature like, you know, French here and, and English here, or whatever languages one and two. Um, I figured I would just have first, second, third, since we're talking about sequences and yeah, there you go. Um, but indeed, right, as we can see an input sequence is passed through the yellow embedding layer, which is then input right here, represented by E, which is then uh, sent into those orange decoders, goes to the context vector, um, is then decoded and then translated into, into words. Um, now, one thing to note is that we do have to add in specific start and end tags, sometimes padding tags, if you have a lot of variation in your sequence lengths. Um, and that's just so that the model can understand those states explicitly, right? Like we don't want to keep generating predicted outputs after um, really the sequence should be ended, right? That's kind of what that's all about. So in case you see, you know, since we'll see that a couple times here, henceforth. Um, a little bit more depth on how the input side of that, uh, of that illustration works. Again, keeping things fairly high level. Um, each input element effectively represents a time step, right? So again, the temporality of sequence to sequence, right? First, second, third, and so on. Um, each new input element that's added to the encoder is is essentially uh, encapsulated by both its embedding, which is represented by E, uh, as well as the learned hidden state represented by H from the previous step, um, right? So as new elements are input, the hidden state is cumulative. Um, and hidden states are effectively a vector representation of the input sequence so far, right? So um, we know, so, you know, H2 will be the cumulative hidden state of, you know, the start token to the first, uh, element of our sequence. Um, uh, now, the hidden or the initial hidden state, right, that H0, um, oftentimes it's usually left empty or zero, or it can be a fixed value, or it can be a learned or weighted parameter. Um, honestly, that's something that can start with a random or fixed guess, uh, but, you know, at and at the end of each training sequence, right? Sometimes people will back propagate to the initial states to, you know, to, to, to reconfigure it or adjust it, you know, throughout their training batches. Again, the options are, there are many, right? Um, but in any case, again, trying to keep things high level. For those curious, again, I'm just generalizing. So, um, you know, what I have illustrated here is not meant to be sort of gospel in that, right? There may be more than one input layer, um, there may be different types of RNNs that are being used, uh, whether it's a gated recurrent unit, long short-term memory, that kind of thing. Again, lots of choices out there. We'll talk about those kinds of choices in a little bit here, but um, again, in general principle, the flow is the same regardless of how you, you know, 
try to technically enhance your model architecture. Um, and then finally, that context vector, again, is essentially the final hidden state of the input sequence, which represents the entire input sequence. Now, the output side of things, um, for the output sequence, again, we append those start and end tags and then decode. And decoding does proceed similarly to encoding. Um, and so indeed, right, the input to the decoder, which you know is here in light green, whoop, there we go, um, is, the is the cumulative of the embedding of the given um, output, right, the fourth, fifth, sixth, uh, which is represented by D in the yellow squares of that particular item, plus the hidden state from the previous time step or output element represented by S, right? So it's essentially the same as the encoding step, just in reverse. Um, one thing uh, to note, though, is that unlike the encoder, the decoder's initial hidden state is the encoder's final hidden state. So the decoder is taking that meaning or the context of the input sequence in order to interpret and provide us with the output sequence. Um, and so as, as such, right, and this is particularly important in any training exercise, right, that uh, you know, we want to note that the embedding layers are distinct for input and output just because of how the, the model works. Um, and finally, because the decoder must translate a hidden state into an output sequence element, each decoder hidden state is passed through a linear prediction layer, which is this dark green part at the top here, um, which results in a prediction for the next element in a sequence. Now, an interesting twist in, into how those outputs are generated, right? Because each element is generated sequentially. And while a start tag is always used for the first input, and of course, because we want to be sure that the model is trained to predict accurately, um, we can actually have the option of randomly relying on the actual known target sequence element, right? So we know that fourth comes first in the output, right? So we can kind of force the model to accurately predict that particular element. Or alternatively, we can just rely on the decoder itself to predict a new element. Um, and you know, train our model accordingly, right? And so this, this kind of that kind of choice is known as teacher forcing, right? Which has the benefit of ensuring that the generated output item is correct, right? So the decoder and the model itself will learn how to represent the output sequence correctly and accurately. Um, and so that's the upside, right? But the downside is that it might not really understand or know how or why it got there, right? So it might so. In, in the case of actual languages, right? You can you can learn grammar, but just because you have grammar doesn't mean that you can speak the language, right? You still need vocabulary and you still kind of have to know what words go where, when, and why um, within those grammatical contexts or rules. Anyway, during training and, and evaluation, right? We always know the length of the input and output sequences. So either way, the decoder will stop generating predictions once the sequence output length is reached. Um, inference and prediction generally sees prediction of output elements until the model outputs one of those end tags. Um, and then finally, right, we'll, we'll calculate a loss based on um, a comparison of the predicted output sequence to the actual output or the expected sequence, which then updates the model parameters as we run through our training iterations. Right, lots of stuff, lots of stuff there, I, I realize, um, but we're in the home stretch. So, and again, and, and, and I've been keeping things relatively high level. Um, it's really tempting. And, and I probably did that a little bit with a teacher forcing bit to kind of get into the weeds, but there's so much interesting stuff here. So, uh, so sorry, not sorry for getting carried away. But with that said, right, we, we do indeed have plenty of options. Um, and I don't know the extent to which the sort of custom customizability exists between PyTorch for sec, sec versus uh, TensorFlow. I can't imagine that it's very different. Uh, one way or the other, both seem to to do um, a good bit of sanit sanitization of the stuff under the hood. But um, certainly uh, PyTorch and again TensorFlow, I'm sure, is the same thing. Still, do give you a little bit of wiggle hands on wiggle room to figure those kinds of things out. Um, and so I'll list a few of these um, hyperparameters and kind of process choices, which you know we could argue are hyperparameters as well, right? Uh, if you want to. Uh, train or test, you know, whether your model is better using one process versus the other. Um, and there are a couple of things that I would like to talk about in a little more detail that will really help to take sec to sec to the next level, especially for sequence prediction. But again, I'm just going to kind of run through the list here quickly and only focus on a couple of them. So again, hyperparameters can range from, you know, teacher forcing the, you know, the degree 
uh, you know, the, or the probability of randomly using teacher forcing uh, or not, right? How many iterations or epics we want to have in, in our training, um, in our training procedure, right? The learning rate, so controlling how quickly model the model adapts to, to training data, um, the hidden size number, so that is to say the number of nodes, the number of uh, RNN layers. Um, usually I've seen in examples on, on the internet, like anywhere between two, three, four, that kind of thing, depending on what's being done. Um, two and four honestly being the most frequent, two for the tutorials, four for most of the academic papers um, that I've come across. Uh, but again, those are those are choices to be made, right? And and uh, different models, different tasks, different data require different choices to be made. Um, otherwise, process decisions, right? We can use an optimizer for to uh, to adjust our network parameters or our network weights. Um, in in my experiment, I just kind of defaulted to use Atom, um, which is canned in PyTorch conveniently. I uh, haven't really looked into anything else, but um, sure, there are plenty of options out there for that. Um, you can choose to use a gated recurrent unit or use long short-term memory for your recurrent neural networks. I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail here in a second. Um, and, or you can apply an attention strategy for decoders, especially, you know, if, if you want to make sure that, uh, in training, in, in training your model, that, uh, the model pays attention to specific nuances in what is occurring across your variants, your various, uh, sample sequences for training. And so, just to kind of quickly talk about um, quickly talk about GRUs and LSTMs, right? Both of these, the reason why these are important to know about, right, is that they both essentially address the vanishing gradient problem uh, by using gates to control the flow of information passing through the network, right? And that's done by learning and preserving information about which inputs in the sequence are important and store them in a memory unit or cell in the case of LSTM. Uh, later passing that info through longer sequences to make predictions. And, and, and honestly, I'm not sure whether one is necessarily better than the other. Um, I guess it depends in part on the use case and the type, quality, or quantity of data on hand. Um, so, you know, with GRUs, for example, right, they tend to be slightly less complex in LSTM since they have fewer gates than LSTM. Uh, controlling the flow of that information uh, into and out of the uh, the context uh, the context vector vis-a-vis -vis our hidden states, um, right? It's pretty good for shorter sequences, better and certainly better if you if you happen to have less training data. Which in my case with the borehole logging thing, um, these were kind of the main uh, drivers for my choice uh, to apply a GRU rather than than an LSTM in the end. Um, it's a pretty good go-to for initial testing because of the increased computational efficiency from having a less complex uh, encoder model. Um, can be fairly easy to modify to add new gates in, in the event that you need to. Um, and uh, really it's, it's a little bit more simplistic in that the hidden content, right, for the hidden states is exposed in the GRU decoder uh, as well, not just, um, it's not just sort of hidden in a black box memory unit and then referred to on and off. Um, LSTMs, on the other hand, again, uh, as I mentioned, they have uh, more gates than uh, GRU. GRU is having two, a reset and update. LSTMs have input, output, and a forget gate. Um, and so, in and so, because of its increased complexity, right? One of the benefits is that you know when you have much longer context-rich sequences, um, LSTMs can actually perform more accurately uh, than GRUs, and um, they can require more training data as a result, given the length of those uh, sequences, uh, than GRUs to see noticeable improvement in accuracy versus GRUs. Um, but again, if you have a lot more data, then you know it's it's worth getting the the extra few percent in accuracy um, if it's needed, right? Um, and so you know, indeed, you know, I, I kind of Im, uh, implied this, right? But you know, more complex architecture often uh, can correspond with more computational uh, expense. Um, not always, but some, but usually, right? And um, and again. Uh, versus GRUs, that memory unit and the hidden content are not exposed when everything is getting passed through to the, to the decoder. Um, so yeah, and I just had a, an example of some of the code that, I've, that I have for my uh, GRU encoder here um, from my experiment, so good times. 
Um, now, on to what I find particularly interesting um, in this space for predicting sequences are the attention decoders, right? And so we could use, like, we could just use our plain uh, GRUs or our LSTM decoders, but attention models in particular were developed to address two critical parts of the encoder decoder model. Right um, now, rather than relying on the model's encoded context vector, so that orange square from before, just as it is, um, which essentially is just a fixed length vector, right? Um, so instead of using that context vector from from which each output element is ultimately decoded, uh, you know, we can potentially end up losing value from individual input elements, especially if the sequence is long, right? So attention models seek to align and translate, and what I mean by that is that first you know, alignment refers to identifying which elements in the input are important or associated with each element of the output, right? And then translation, all that really refers to is just, you know, using that relevant information uh, that's important or, yeah, or relevant or important information rather to select the appropriate output element. Um, and so this is particularly useful if, you know, you know we know that for borehole, uh, lithography, you know, that topsoil will usually come first and bedrock will usually come last. But what about the stuff in between, right? If, if in a given region or drill site or area, right, there's a specific expected spot where, you know, a particular bit of mud or your pay zone is expected in a particular type of layer that, you know, appears more consistently in, you know, a particular part of your sequence or your lithography sentence than you know any other, then it's worth knowing that, right? When when you're um, trying to get your model to you know understand the context and the nature of those sequences, so attention models can really help with that. Um, and so what they are is is they're essentially like another little shallow neural network that's uh, plopped on top of the decoder to determine the weights uh, in pro in the process of back propagating those hidden states, right? So determining essentially determining what your predicted output output is going to be based on the context vector. So rather than just taking the context vector as a whole and, and essentially kind of guessing that this is going to be more likely to be in this spot than something else, right? Then you can at least pay attention to the specific part of that initial input sequence to, you know, make a more confident decision as to what you expect in order for your output. Um, and so, yeah, there are different characteristics or types that you might come across or read about, right? One of them being global, right? Which just means that attention is paid to all the hidden states of the encoder, right? So it's at, you know, in, in any process or any situation, right? All of those hidden states across the entire context vector are gonna be taken into consideration. Local is the opposite, right? Attention is paid only to a few hidden states of the encoder. Uh, hard attention is a type of local approach typically that selects one hidden state at a time explicitly rather than kind of like looking at two or three out of a set of however many. Um, and soft attention is, is more along the lines of a global-ish approach in which weights are placed softly over some, over a handful or in or typically all hidden states. And again, there's a lot of reading about this across the board, but hopefully sort of get you primed to, to know what to look for, to think about um, as, you, as you look into this a bit deeper. Um, but indeed, again, in a nutshell, right? Instead of relying on a single general context vector as a whole, attention models develop a dynamic context vector in that it is specifically filtered for each individual output element to be predicted. And so which one to use, right? Big difference is honestly how the context vector is derived. Right, the sort of the granddaddy, the originator, the first one that uh, the earliest one that I can kind of see, uh, it's most frequently um, cited as sort of like a seminal attention model is the one developed by Badenow et al. Right, and that's the one that and, and it uses concaten a concatenation of forward and backward source hidden states in in a bidirectional encoder uh, and target hidden states in a unidirectional decoder. I believe if I have that right. Um, and at any input or hidden state step, right? So the model is essentially building from the previous hidden state, right? As it's as it's encoding. So it's not using the current hidden state to calculate weights and generated uh, weighted context vectors. Um, and so there's an additional step or an additional layer that happens there before um, translation into a prediction occurs, right? And so you know some have argued that this tends to be somewhat computationally expensive compared to other methods out there. Um, and 
uh, just reading the paper, right? It looks like only one alignment function was tested in the development of the attention model, but it, it at least does set a benchmark. And so the, you know, the Luang et al attention decoder, which is the one that, uh, that I'm using in my little experiment. And I have a snippet of my code here, um, just to kind of, uh, show off that, you know, there is some Python in this project. Haha. -ha. Um, right. So Luang et al, right. They use, they use hidden states, at the top layer in both encoder and decoder. So there's so there aren't there aren't these added mini layers that are that are present in the decoder models, right? Um, tip, it tends to use the current hidden state rather than the previous hidden state directly to update local weights, and thus it generates a weighted context vector to align with those target hidden states. Um, it's slightly less computationally expensive because of those fewer layer because of the fewer layers than the Badenow et al. approach. Um, and in their paper, they uh, they use multiple alignment functions just to test and to find out uh, and ultimately right select the optimal approach for their model. Um, and I do have citations for all this stuff that I'm referring to and kind of the basis of all my blah blah at the end of the presentation. So hopefully, if the slides are shared or maybe there will be you know some way to to disseminate that for anyone who's curious uh, but again um, there's lots of material out there and it's i don't know the more the more you dig into it the interest the more interesting it, it gets um, anyway just to wrap up though so that's basically sec to sec in a nutshell and so um, i'd like to quickly run through a couple of challenges to keep in mind um, if you're curious to test this model out um, making a quick pit stop here right Keep in mind, it can require a lot of data to effectively train, right? To a point where, you know, your results may be satisfactory. Um, and that's especially the case if you don't have the luxury of pre-trained vectors, right? So, so fair warning when you go out into the interwebs to look up examples and tutorials, um, a lot of them in, do indeed use, um, uh, you know, language to language translation examples, right? And so oftentimes you'll see that they tend to use spacey models uh, that feature pre-trained vectors um, and all that sort of thing for the given language, like English, German, French, Spanish, sort of the typical example languages out there. And there are more language models emerging all the time, right? Um, and, you know, but of course, this can be especially challenging when the sequence data are sparse or full of rare elements or they're a non-traditional type of data. Um, depending on the data themselves, so the length of sequences and the complexity of your model architecture, Right. This can also be potentially computationally expensive too. So just keep that in mind as well, and kind of think about when you're tinkering and and uh, and tuning your hyperparameters and that sort of thing. Keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, you know, like PyTorch kind of made it pretty pretty easy to to expose um, how you know CUDA versus GPU approaches or CPU CUDA versus CPU approaches are used or how they're applied. Um, and it's pretty easy to toggle. Um, and I'm sure it's the same in uh, TensorFlow, but you know, fair fair to say that not everyone has a really good graphics card that makes you know GPU usage worthwhile, or they don't want to you know burn up their graphics card because those are hard to come by nowadays, apparently. Um, and uh, right, not everyone has access to you know cloud computing or supercomputing, right? So again, keep just keep that sort keep that stuff in mind. But you know, whatever, we're still interested in trying it out, so. You know, just a reminder here that you know RNNs can be used in a variety of contexts, right? Do you have temporality in your data, right? Do the lengths of your inputs or your sequences vary from one input to the next, right? Um, does contextual information in the sequences in your inputs matter, right? Um, are are the values orderable, right? Um, but not necessarily continuous, right? So they're discrete ordered values. Uh, can the values be logically analyzed in discrete steps, right? If that's the case, RNNs might be a way to go. Um, and, you know, RNNs can be used uh, in those contexts where one or more of the above conditions, again, are important um, in a variety of ways, right? We can think of this as a many to one, such as, you know, a single output item or classification after a sequential input, right? So stuff like sentiment analysis or classification. You can have many to many tasks where each output label is associated with a segment of the input, um, not strictly dependent on correspondence between input and output uh, labels, right? So this is oftentimes seen in like speech to text images, com some computer type image, image problems. So images to text, vice versa, that kind of thing. And then finally, generative tasks, right? Which is really where the language to language translation and chatbots come in, 
right? And when we when we talk about generative tasks, we're, we're referring to output uh, outputs that are sequences generated from input sequences, taking the entire input sequence into account. And really this can apply to any uh, multi-element sequence to sequence task, um, whatever those elements are made up of. So, so that was a lot of information to take in, um, but uh, hopefully I've, I've gotten at least some of you to start thinking about, uh, you know, uh, what sec what the sec to sec model is? Maybe you can use it in your um, in in any of your projects. Like if if you happen to have a, a use case that maybe fits the bill with some of our uh, with some of these uh, contexts. There's a lot of information, as I've said a couple times tonight, um, out there on the internet that you can research, read about. Lots of tutorials, lots of examples. Um, some great ones, some not as great, but. Again, I encourage uh, all of you to go out there, take a look, see what, see if it makes sense if you're interested, and and yeah, um, happy to take any questions or you know talk about things that sort of thing. So y'all can connect with me as as such if we don't have time today to go through Q and A, but yeah, um, and then yeah, at the end of the slide, I just you know I, I do have a bunch of um, bunch of readings here uh, that I refer to while putting this together. So hopefully if this gets uh, spread around, then um, then y'all can check out some of these. But these are pretty frequently cited anyway. So uh, even if you don't have this particular slide on hand, I'm sure you'll find these readings one way or the other. So thanks, guys. For the talk, it was uh, very impressive. And uh, you put it in the really nice and sort of understand way. So great job. Um, we have any questions? I see, I think, yeah, I see one in the QA. Uh, would it be possible to use the H0 value to seed and tune the sequence prediction for a particular geological information? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, th I think like when we, when we think about where those hidden, initial hidden states come from, right? Um, again, there are different ways that you can go about doing this whether you want to just set it randomly at zero or some other value. But um, if there is a, if there is a reason for a fixed value, um, then, you know, it's the same principle as bringing in, you know, pre-trained vectors from some other model, right? So in, in a sense, right, a lot of the examples that you'll find online that are using language to language translators, um, you know, they'll import spacey models in order to help, you know, pre-train the model so that the demos or, or their, you know, their sandboxes don't take forever to train. Um, but essentially it's the same principle, right? So we could, we could essentially bring in like pre, like a known context vector to get us started. And then as we bring in new inputs, that initial hidden state would by definition be updated as we bring new inputs into our encoder. So no reason not to, um, they were just, you know, for whatever the context, whether we're talking about geological formations or languages, right, you just have to make sure that it's justified. And so if it's for a particular formation, then, you know, you, you could have a particular model configuration to, to train for this particular formation or that formation or whatever else, right? Um, I don't want to get too far into the geology bit because, again, I know very little. So I don't want to say something too, super stupid. But... Um, Short answer is yes. I think uh, I think it is possible, and and depending on your use case, uh, could be very important if not useful. Well, thanks. I actually have a question. Since you mentioned you mentioned Spacey, um, why did you choose to use the sequence to sequence that you actually implemented yourself rather than you know using a uh, Spacey or like anything else, G uh, GPL or like you know any other uh, libraries? Oh yeah. So, um, well, so part of it is I don't, well, I don't actually know if there are pre-trained models out there for geological formation. So if there are, I am more than happy to, to take those suggestions and to try them out. Um, as to why I didn't use spacey in particular, well, that was just based on the data. So like the kind of data that I, uh, that we're using, at least for this particular piece of our big experiment is, just those lithography keywords, right? Or anything that we want to add to them. So essentially each in each piece of the input is, you know, topsoil, till, you know, sandy till or sandy clay. Or we can augment that by having each element represented not just by the actual, you know, the 
the soil sample or the lithography, but the lithography plus color, right? So it could be like gray till, brown till, brown clay, that kind of thing, right? And so as 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 tokens in and of themselves, right? They didn't really strike me as compatible with Spacey since, you know, just thinking about like, for example, with uh, named entity recognition, like what exactly would, like how exactly would space would the Spacey model relate um, like a parsed and tokenized sentence, you know, from, you know, a normal language into a lithography sentence. Um, if, and, and I guess I also don't really understand enough about stratigraphy to know if there's like an actual grammar to stratigraphy. So um, that's on me in a way, but that that's kind of my justification, I guess. Uh, Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so have you considered all the ML inspired architectures for hyperparameter tuning? For example, performing some sort of hierarchical or heuristic search yeah, yeah. I mean, so so for the um, so for the experiment, I was just kind of like tinkering manually again, just to kind of get things to work um, and try to keep things as simplistic as possible. Um, and at, and at this point, I had I, I have my I have my system set up for just to train and uh, train and test rather than train valid test, or I guess it would be train validate. Um, in an actual in practice situation, you'd want to have all three, right? Because a there's that extra sense of surety, but then you know. It, it's th those those first two splits are critically important, right? Because you know we can we can run a whole bunch of different uh, uh, trainings on our training data, and then we can compare different versions of our trained model. That is to say, you know, in terms of referring to hyperparameter tuning, um, using that validation set. So you know, any like, I don't I don't think it necessarily matters which um, which tuning strategy you you take i mean anything from heuristic grid you know grid searches that kind of thing again depending on your resources on hand because you know we know that grid search can sometimes be rather expensive depending on how much it is that you're tuning and across what ranges if you have continuous values and blah 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 um but again yeah abs absolutely that's something that that you know for for a real world application that isn't just a sandbox to see you know to see if it works or doesn't um absolutely you'd want to you'd want to uh, apply that kind of strategy, um, and whether that means you know a holistic hyperparameter tuning strategy, um, if you let's say have you know stratification questions, like if you want to break it up into multiple training sessions again, if that's what you want to do, and if that's what's um, appropriate, then cool, go for it as long as it's justified and it makes sense. So actually, a personal experience, I use AutoML to do like baseline analysis, and uh, if you know. Uh, there is uh, restricted time I use AutoML. Otherwise, I just do it manually because I will always get better scores. So, <laughs> oh yeah, if, uh, yeah. yeah if I don't you got a tight deadline, then you probably can't use AutoML stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to get on too much of a soapbox, but um, and and maybe this will make me an enemy of some. But I don't. I I don't. I never feel good with auto anything. Like when it's <laughs> AutoML or like with auto arimas with time series, or I know H2O has a pretty neat uh, auto ML API yeah, and everything, yeah. but like, how do you know, you know, like how do you, I, I don't know. I, and, and I know <laughs> that it, it, do, it does work. It does work. Right. But what if it doesn't work? I, I don't know. I, I'm paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, how did you encode the lithography, uh, litho lithographic uh, layers? Right. So the data, the, the data that I had was, and I guess I could probably uh, bring up, um, bring up a quick example of the data, or actually I can, yeah, actually I have an, ev an even better idea. Maybe, maybe YYC DataCon will rear its ugly head again. Let's see. Well, it wasn't that ugly. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be too glib. Um, let's see here. I'm going to have to reshare my screen uh, really quick. Give me two seconds. Uh, is this it? Um, that is not it. Hang on. One moment. Oh, where are you? Sorry about this. Anyway, what I did is um, I, I took... Okay, there we go. This should... This should work. All right. Open this up data prep. 
All right, and this is of course zoomed in to like a thousand percent. So let's get it down. All right, so the data that we had came in as such, right? So we just kind of had um, each individual row was um, a particular lithographic layer. And so we had information about the PRI material was sort of the lithography keyword. So till, silt, sand, till, shale for this particular borehole. Um, information about color. And there was, you know, full text that we could draw from if we wanted additional information. Um, but for that initial test, right, again, keeping things super simple just to see if, if my code was going to work, um, which was honestly like the big goal at the first stage, uh, was just to bring in those initial keywords. Um, so the, the till, silt, sand, and that kind of vocabulary. Now, um, after doing a bit of cleaning to make sure that everything was okay, you know, removing, you know, our blank or, or our unknown um, values, blah, blah. So data prep, all the fun things in, in, in the jobs that we do. Um, ultimately, right, the first step was to transform the data frame from long to wide, right? So long form being, you know, each individual uh, record was that uh, material layer. And so just basically write those sentences, right? So the first sentence for the first borehole was till, silt, sand, till, shale, then till, sand, sandy clay, and shale, and so on. Um, and so the way that the data were fed into the model and the way that it was trained was in the principle that, um, you know, blah, 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 you know, some, there's a bit more uh, transforma uh, transformation there. Okay, here we go. This is, this is the key part, I think, that's of interest here to answer your question, is that, you know, in the interest of, of making this compatible with what we would think of as like an autofill, right? So like when you type in a search into your into Google, then you'll write the first couple of words and it'll auto-populate the rest of the sentence, either with one word or two or three or however many it takes uh, based on what, you know, crazy or weird things that other people in the internet have searched. And in this case, right, it's the same kind of principle where we know that this is our sequence, right? And um, essentially, right, we want the the model to know that, well, if we input till, then it should be able to predict the next four layers. Or if we have the first two, we'll be able to predict the next three, right? So it's very similar also to the kind of, uh, to the kind of approach where, you know, you want to see if like you type the first letter of a word, can your, can your neural network, per, uh, can it like sequentially predict what the next letter in, in the word is going to be and, you know, go that way rather than predicting individual tokens on and on. So, you know, as inputs and outputs were fed into the encoders, right, the inputs were fed into one set to one layer of encoders and the outputs were fed into a separate uh, layer of encoders, all the while keeping um, each input output pair together. Um, so, so that the model would be able to predict as such. I don't know if that, I think that answers the question as far as like how that was set up for the lithography layers. Yeah, just as, as my question popping popping back in here, hijacking the camera. Um, so whenever you whenever you take it from like till to like, how do you take till to a numerical vector? So that's so that's accomplished in the embedding layer, right? And so, you just use one hot encoding, or do you have some type of vector representation? Vector representation, yeah. And it's how did you, that. yeah? How how did you get that into like is is like sandy shale or like sandy clay closer to clay and sand, or is it just like till is encoded as like zero or till is encoded as you know everything's just like a one hot encoding? Oh, you know what? Yeah, I I I think the way that I think the way that I had it set up was for one hot encoding. Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Cool. Yeah. 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 Sorry, it's been it's been a little while. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Makes sense. Nice. Have you actually just out of curiosity, have you tried any tree based algorithms like the XGBoost or anything? Not yet. Um and uh and, and indeed like as a as a kind of a fallback, that typically would be you know, the go-to, especially given the quantity of data. Um, the reason for, again, the reason for, for using sequence to sequence is I just wanted to try something new that I hadn't tried before. Um, but indeed, like in, in the worst case, right, there are, there are decision tree methods out there that can be used to kind of, um, that can be used to predict those kinds of outputs in, you know, an, in an ensemble fashion, right? It's just a matter of 
putting that together. But yeah, for the, but again, given that this was an experiment, right? Like your point is well taken. Like why not use something that we are more confident it'll work with as little data as I have. But at the same time, given that there's no cost to this, like I'm not up against deadlines other than like, am I presenting tomorrow or not, right? Other than that, right, there's there's no cost. So if, if it ends up not working, um, then fair enough, right? But at least we know that it didn't work. Um, for, for the next iteration of this experiment, I'm still going to stick with sec to sec for as long as I can because I, I feel like, you know, over time, like there's a much better chance that we'll find and dig up some more of these kinds of data that we can just kind of plop in and and see if if it is in fact um, a, a a data size issue. Um, but again, that's that's how we can figure that out. Because if if it still doesn't work, then it's clearly not a data size issue, and there's other issues that we have to deal with. So, but it's, I guess that's part of the fun in my in you know if, if I had to rationalize it. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So uh, you mentioned that such sec to sec uh, model takes a lot of data to train. Uh, curious how and if that poses any unique challenges in the geological surveying domain. Yeah, so that's probably where my expertise um, quickly nears its end. Um, so I don't know that I can speak a whole lot to what's out there, um, and I don't want to. And I don't want to, you know, say anything that you know for the geoengineers and geologists in the room, or those of you who have dealt with these data before. You know, you're gonna raise your fingers and be like, "Ah, yeah, this guy's wrong," because I probably will be. So, um, so I don't, I'm all that to say, I'm not really sure. Um, I think, I think from what I've seen, it's fair to say that that's probably going to be fairly challenging, uh, just given what's out there, but from, you know, from what I've learned about, you know, mining and energy projects in general. So again, I'm going to be really vague here as, as vague as I can, um, due to how much or rather how little I know. Um, but obviously like a lot of there's. I wonder if there's a lot more information out there, but it's proprietary, right? Like exploration data in particular, you're not going to like as a mining company looking for gold or diamonds or, or stuff like that, or coal or, or oil or gas, you're not going to like publish your results on the internet, you know, allowing competitors to come and, you know, scoop your findings. Right. Which that's, again, I don't want to be too glib about that, but you know, that I think is, is something to keep in mind. So you know, this might, this might be something worth testing out. Like if there's someone, if someone out there has a project that comes across their desk to do something along these lines, and it comes from a larger mining company, um, then, uh, you know, they may have a lot of data that's just been hidden away because it's because it is proprietary, right? Um, they may have tens of thousands of these borehole samples across many decades, right? As long as uh, the industry has been out there and, you know, seeing, you know, I, I can see, you know, uh, Mike there coming to my rescue as well, right? Even the stuff that's out there publicly is also trapped in uh, PDF jail, right? Not just in terms of like, OC, like the OCR readable stuff is at least nice because then you can like plop it through Amazon or whatever platform you have to convert your PDFs into tables or you can write something yourself, but if it's handwritten, then, you know, I guess you could try to train an, an, an image recognizer to try to OCR um, handwriting. But, you know, if if the particular person who is logging the borehole has, you know, the same kind of handwriting as your general practitioner, good luck. Exactly. That's uh, definitely a lot of overhead for sure. Yeah. So then where can we find the sources of the ge uh, geographical data for training the model? Um, so one area that I would, that I would recommend, and again, um, so keep your eyes on the chat. I, Mike, I encourage you to, uh, to, to share some, some ideas there. Um, he's been, he's been kind of the font of data, uh, for me, cause he has a better idea of where to look, but, um, there is a really neat source out there. Uh, it's called wellwiki.org. Um, and it has a lot of information about, um, about, uh, drilling and wells, uh, and kind of, you know, geographical data related to drilling and that sort of thing um, across uh, Alberta. So, you know, there's stuff that's associated with the Alberta energy regulators. You know, you can find stuff for BC there. You can find stuff for, you know, all, you know, 
virtually all the states in the US that have any of these projects. I don't know how much they have globally, but I'm sure there's stuff there too. Um, so right on, there it is. Uh, yeah, Jay, Jay grabbed that um, for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there are different sources. I think, you know, like the U S geological survey has a lot of really good data, um, that you can dig for there. Um, as well as, you know, if, if you just reach out to some of their scientists, I was on a project when I was in grad school, wasn't looking at geology per se, it was using a Landsat data to, um, to monitor differences in agricultural uses in Cambodia pre and post civil war, really obscure, I understand, but like to be able to get our hands on a lot of that Landsat data from USGS, all we had to do is just like, hey, we can't find this super easily on your on your website. Like we need this and this and this, can you help us? And they just like sent us zip files. So, so sometimes all you have to do is just ask. So uh, Mike posted some great material in the chat. Feel free to check it out. Yeah. Um, next question is, how do we validate the performance of this model? Yeah, so for performance validation, I, I used, um, oh, I, and I closed the window, go figure. Uh, so I ended up using um, just, uh, just a basic loss calculation. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't do anything super creative. I just kind of took what was, what was offered in a couple of the tutorials. Um, but uh, let me see if I can bring up um, an example of that, just so you can kind of see it. And of course, I have to find it. Sorry, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't planning on sending this part. So that's totally fine. So um, don't don't um, criticize me too much. Is all I'm asking. <laughs> um, that's totally fine. But yeah, I it was it was essentially it's essentially based on um, the the uh, it's essentially based on matching the decoded values uh, to the target uh, values that are supposed to be there. Um, so you can calculate, you know, your, your training and validation loss. I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything particularly special as far as what the loss calculation is, but um, yeah, I think, I think, I think just in a nutshell, it's, it's a, it's just a variation of uh, like, typical CTC losses, but, um, but yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, do I have more questions? Seems like, uh, I'm, com for now. I'm coming in here. Some questions. Uh, so yeah. Pete, Pete, if you're going to pick this back up, where would you move next? Like, what would you, what would you look at next? What would I look at next? Well, the first thing I need to do is, uh, is, is I need to, well, I have I have new data that I can tinker with that I've started to tinker with, um, so just applying that. Um, probably one of the things that I want to do is is also uh, like mess around with some of those, um, start messing around with some of the other hyperparameters. In particular, uh, the number the number of layers that are being used. So at the the model that I was that I was using, so the architecture as it was um, in this occasion, I think there's a here we go. Um, so I just I I had just sort of picked an arbitrary number of hidden layers, which were sort of a, a number in between um, the number of unique inputs, uh, input tokens, and unique output tokens. Um, which, again, something that you know in the real world you'd want to tune appropriately. Um, but just as a, I don't know that there are any real rule, rules of thumb for that. But yeah, a lot of everything was arbitrary. Probably go to four layers because um, it it. It seems that in in most of the in most of the literature out there that covers this topic, most people are using two in two uh, input encoding layers versus two output decoding layers. So you know perhaps I ought to use four layers rather than just two. Um, that's something worth worth trying out. Um, and yeah, also like besides just trying out the new data, also just like manipulating the data in and of themselves. Because one of the big problems that I ran into in the first the first try was that um, the the data were just saturated with till, which surprise surprise, there's a lot of till in Alberta, um, right? But at the same time, though, like there is variation within those till layers as well. So things like appending color or taking into account other uh, elements of uh, those particular layers is, is uh, something worth trying. The, the downside to that is that as you start to increase the variation in the different types of uh, 
inputs that can be brought into the model, right? Then that reduces the model's capacity to learn the nuances of your sequences, right? Unless you have more data to compensate for that, right? Because if you if you have a really sparse uh, if you have a really sparse set of uh, of inputs, then you know you'll only see a particular important layer once in a set of let's say a thousand boreholes, and is that or a thousand sentences? Or in this case, I only had I think um, I think I only had 191 unique boreholes that I was working with. I think now I have up to 300 some. Um, so I don't know how much of an improvement that's going to make, but one step at a time. So and actually on and, and that kind of dovetails into another maybe discussion. So Mike's posting a, well, there's a, a lot of good chatter in the in the chat about other data sources. And yes. did you did you take a look at like pre-trained like pre-training on a larger data source? Like Mike was saying, there's a bunch of Australian data. Do you look at like pre-training or consider like pre-training on another data set and then doing a transfer learning approach or to try and kind of like blend in and enlarge your data set in any way using other, you know, data from other geographic locations? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm never opposed. I'm never opposed to more data. I mean, simply put, um, and it, and it makes sense too, uh, potentially. Like, I think, I, I think the, the one thing to keep in mind is, is that, you know, um, or maybe I, and, or maybe this doesn't matter. I, I guess, you know, I, I can let the SMEs, um, SMEs argue alternatively, but you know, the only thing that I would try to keep in mind is if I was going to use transfer learning, like using a pre-trained model, um, in the Alberta context, let's say, then, um, I would think that whatever we have pre-trained would at least be somewhat similar to what's, to what we know, at least contextually for Alberta topography, um, Right, because like if you have com if you have a completely different geology, uh, then like it it probably won't do a lot to help um, in your particular region of interest. But yeah. then again, I don't know if that would make that much of a difference. Yeah, I mean, this is like it's kind of speculation at this point, yeah. right? But like, if you're gonna like transfer learn from like a German language model onto a French language, like French German to English to French to English, right? like there's different like there are definitely different spaces. But like you know, it's mm -hmm. like they're still going to learn some of the semantics around translating language. And you would imagine like if you use like Australian, you know, a big massive Australian data set, it kind of mm -hmm. learns the, you know, how to extract information about lithography kind of in mm -hmm. this uh, pure, pure speculation, just kind of having fun yeah. with the experiment. Well, I mean, like the, the nice thing is, 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 you know, now I can speak authoritatively, right. In, in that, you know, regardless of regardless of the region, right? We shouldn't expect topsoil to follow bedrock. So, so like there there will be, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that there will be some consistencies. But the degree to which the degree to which that matters, I I don't I, I'm not I'm not sure. But at, on the other hand, there's one way to find out. <laughs> cool beans. So uh, Ben, do you have more questions or? Very good. Awesome. Great. So uh, there are some really good resources in the chat. So definitely check it out. And in the meantime, I'm going to post the uh, link in the chat again for the um, Python license draw. And uh, if you feel like you want to participate, definitely do it right now because I'm going to do a live draw right now. And um, yeah, we will do a virtual hangout. So uh, after we stop this current view, uh, feel free to join tables and talk to different people. And uh, yeah, uh, one one quick one quick shout out, if I may, yeah. um, and just to kind of echo uh, Mike's comment in the chat. We will be doing another run at this to present at the Neo Four J Nodes conference in June. I think it's on the seventeenth. Um, and I think we're presenting at 9 a.m., but I don't remember. Uh, so yes, June 17th. Uh, so check it out if you're interested to see the next version of the Till Predictor, um, and uh, along with act some actually really cool stuff that we're that we're playing around with in the uh, in the 3D data modeling space. Awesome. Thanks for the info. And uh, can you share me your uh, slides later? Yes, absolutely. I'll send those in an email after af after we wrap up. Awesome. And the recordings will be posted in a few days. Please uh, give me a few days to process them. Um, and yeah, have a great evening. And uh, hopefully I will see you next time. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.